How are we doing, beautiful people? Everyone enjoying Nashville? Enjoying being drenched in the humidity? It's like going outside, breathing through a moist sponge all the time. But try to keep it cool today. Got a great panel. A um, bunch of wonderful mining professionals up here. We're going to be talking about different strategies for an ensuring success and making sure that you know, uh, your mining revenue as a company is diversified and you're you know, looking for ways in which you can you know, kind of be making a little bit of money when Bitcoin is maybe not doing so great or hash price is not doing so great. So um, to start, I just would love everyone to give quick introductions on, you know, their professional experience um, and, uh, you know, all of the companies that y'all work for. So, Rob, we'll start with you. Sure thing. My name is Robert Warren. I'm the manager of mining projects and ops analysis at Riot Platforms and the author of the Bitcoin Miners Almanac. And come to mining as the way many do, which is as a philosophy major. And Bitcoin class of 2017 uh, thought that mining might be an interesting place to go in 2020 and have not been able to escape since. Yeah, I'm... Is this on? Yeah. I'm Mitchell Askew. I'm the head of intelligence at Blockware, so we're a vertically integrated mining company. I'm also the author of The Conservative Case for Bitcoin, so I wrote that book uh, earlier this year. And for Blockware, I do all of our market research, analysis, social media content, and I uh, put a lot of content on Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining, so I'm excited to talk with these guys. Awesome. Tom Macero, uh, class of 2018 in Bitcoin mining, uh, resident here in Tennessee, homesteader, uh, CEO and co-founder of Kungsland and Inc. Uh, we just finished a merger with Cathedral Bitcoin. We're a uh, basically a hybrid infrastructure company that builds um, uh, basically high density compute infrastructure and I'm uh, glad to be here. Aiden Killick, present CEO of Hive. Hive is the first public crypto miner going public way back in 2017. I was inspired by Hive. I'm actually the founder of what's now Cathedra, so small world. And yeah, class of Bitcoin 2017. We've uh, been diversifying since diversifying was cool. We had an Ethereum strategy back in 2018. That morphed into HPC last year. So yeah, and uh, you know, five, five exahash plus running. Sweet, thanks y'all. And I'm Colin Harper. I'm the editor in chief of Blockspace Media business-to-business -business Bitcoin uh, publication. We cover a lot of stuff in the mining industry, cover uh, Bitcoin tech and culture and things like that. So um, for this panel, I'm going to ask all of our panelists direct questions. And then, like I said, y'all just jump in after the original responder is done with anything else y'all want to talk about, anything that stands out or any points that you want to make. Hot takes, always welcome. Um, Tom, I want to start with you because I think the biggest avenue for diversifying mining revenues right now, or at least the one that's talked about the most and has the most hype, is in the realm of artificial intelligence and HPC. And you had a Twitter post a while back talking about the mullet miner um, versus the trad miner. And every time I think of mullet miner, I have an image of David Spade smoking a Pall Mall on top of an S19J Pro. So could you maybe kind of unpack that a little bit and um, you know, kind of explain that thesis of this kind of emerging trend that we see miners, you know, announcing HPC strategies and those who are kind of keeping it more traditional, just focusing on hash rate. Yeah, for sure. And uh, just to make sure I give credit where credit, credit is due is uh, Nick Gates over Sushi uh, in Houston was the first one who brought that up. I've just popularized it. Um, I think, I think really where, where it comes down to is uh, after the halvening, there was, uh, you know, there's some pressure on miners, depending on their business models, to make sure that they can stay um, resilient. And the opportunity that comes from, obviously, the onslaught of all of these GPUs that need to be plugged in, that cannot be plugged in in traditional data center space right now, um, makes an interesting opportunity for companies that specialize in infrastructure, as we've seen with, with Core Scientific uh, and Core Weave. And so now you're seeing this bifurcation, I think, in terms of the public mining space, where you're seeing the mullet miners who are basically utilizing um, you know, the ability to provide infrastructure in various business models within that way um, to augment their Bitcoin mining uh, strategies. And to make, more importantly, it's to make sure that they are viable moving forward. So that's a, you know, they're saying, hey, this is our stake in the ground. And obviously there's, there's five or six companies that are doing that. And then you have your trad miners who are just saying, hey, this is what we do. It's almost like caveman. They have very different strategies with like large mega sites and they do mining and they do it well and they're sticking to it. And I think in, you know, three or four years, we're going to see who wins. Do you have anything to add to that? I, 
I kind of reject the term trad mining, to be honest with you. <laughs> I was trying to be nice to them because I was going to use like more of a pejorative <laughs> term because obviously I'm in the mullet mining side of things. Because pe- I've heard people call it trad mining, pure play mining. But I've, I kind of struggle with that, to be honest with you, because I think, I think, you know, who is the customer of a Bitcoin mine? And the first thing that everybody thinks of is, is whoever you're selling your hash to, right? Are you hashing independently, making your own templates, in which case you're finding blocks, you're being rewarded in Bitcoin for that. That's hash price. That's this metric that we all love to track. Um, or you're going to a pool, they're taking a small fee, they're creating the block template, and they're providing a service. So that's the customer of your product, which is the hash rate. But there's two other things that we're talking about, too. You're talking about load, and then you're talking about heat. Because a miner fundamentally has, has three physical connections. It has the electrical connection, the internet connection, and then it has whatever sort of cooling mechanism that you have to use, whether it's immersion or air-cooled, to keep it from overheating when it's pissed off at you in Houston in the middle of the summer. And I think there's something interesting, which is that we always think about mining in the sense of my customer is the network. And so hash price is my, my sole monetary reward. But I don't think that does a full service to two other necessary elements of what mining is, which is keeping the thing cool. So how do I monetize my heat, which is a necessary product of this process? And then the load itself, which is electricity is a pretty well understood commodity, at least in, in, uh, in the large scale sense. You know, you have... Uh, you have spaces like ERCOT where you're, you're trading derivatives within a, an unregulated market and you have a free-floating price of electricity. The load itself is also a valuable asset. So I, I struggle with this idea of sort of, are you a pure play Bitcoin miner? Are you a, a traditional Bitcoin miner? Because to me, it seems like you couldn't remove a single one of those elements from mining and have it still be mining. And if you've got it there, well, you better be finding a way to monetize it because, as we all know, you know, hash price is not, uh, is not trending to the sky anytime soon, or at least based on what you can conservatively fiscally estimate for. Yeah, for sure. And I think, like, uh, you know, there's different verticals within each one of those segments, right? Like, you know, all the Texas miners um, are, are in a unique position because they have the ability to kind of work ERCOT in a way where, you know, where you guys do, a, 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 I think, um, you know, quite a bit of, of, I would say, like unique revenue opportunities where traditional miners wouldn't have that. And you almost become like a hybrid um, power company in, in the sense. And, you know, that, that's like one, you know, one interesting business model within like the prop mining side. And then on like the mullet side, you know, you've got some folks who had leftover ETH miners from before, and so they'll use those. Or you've got you know, folks like us where we'll say, you know what, we don't want exposure to the underlying GPUs. We just want to build the infrastructure and make a rip off of that. You've got some folks who are out going out and buying large uh, quantities of GPUs. So it's just, yeah, it's, it's not as simple as two, those two descriptions, but um, it's the business models inside that I think, you know, I think will, it'll be interesting to watch how things come because at the end of the day, there's something emerging with, uh, I think, the popularity and the success of what Michael Saylor's built. And it's this idea of like how much Bitcoin you can hold on your balance sheet in a responsible way that doesn't affect like the growth and resiliency of your company. And so I think, you know, what's unique about all those business models is like there's kind of a competition for, you know, even if I wasn't even using ASICs or if I'm using my AI compute revenue to stack more Bitcoin and I, and I'm able to do that better. I think like, Whoever stacks the most Bitcoin wins. It doesn't matter how you do it, you know, from that standpoint. I liked y'all uh, making those distinctions between the different business models within, like you were saying, Rod, uh, or, uh, tra- uh, TradFi or Trad Mining. It's like crew cut mining is, is uh, maybe what I'll start calling it um, to, to continue the metaphor. But, you know, you, you made the good point that it's like, you know, traditional mining. What does that even mean? There are so many different routes to go because at the end of the day, especially industrial scale miners, they're not just miners. They are infrastructure plays for the grid. Um, and when I think about those different business models, um, especially with regards to AI and HPC and I, and I want to kick this one to you. Um, Tom kind of furnished this, um, the first part of this answer a little bit, talking about all the different strategies. But I think when people talk about mining as a monolithic industry, we kind of run the risk of doing the same thing with miners engaging in AI and HPC. So, like, 
um, my question for you, Aiden, is what exactly is Hive's approach to HPC and AI? And what are the pros and cons of some of these different approaches of, you know, owning the computers and hosting them somewhere or doing something like a Corsi model where you're leasing out a data center to then lease to other people for the compute? Um, what are some of the strategies and what made Hive settle on its strategy? Yeah, I, I think <clears throat> that's an excellent question. I'm actually going to address that by taking it back to how Hive was founded, right? So Executive Chairman Frank Holmes, he wanted to start a Bitcoin ETF back in the day, 2017. Couldn't do it back then. That's only now been possible seven years later. So crypto mining, right, as a publicly traded equity was the answer, and that's how Hive was born. So when you think of delivering value to shareholders, right, how do you create the highest margins, the best cash flow return on invested capital? Right, and that's why Hive actually started as an Ethereum miner. And I'm happy to say that at a Bitcoin conference because we're also a Bitcoin miner, but really to summarize the whole mindset and really to simplify what is a mullet miner, what is this, what is a HPC is, you're either building infrastructure and offering colo, right? And if you're offering hosting, maybe at six cents, maybe at seven cents, and that's a low margin business. Then you invest more CapEx and take a bit more risk and maybe you run ASICs yourself and you earn Bitcoin. And right now S21s are doing 12 cents a kilowatt hour, right? When we were running, mine, uh, running GPUs mining ETH, we had GPUs that were doing 90 cents a kilowatt hour revenue, right? And that was a really high margin business, right? After the merge, we pivoted those GPUs into doing HPC, which depending on the model of the card, an A40, an H100, an A5000, you're looking at anywhere from 2 to $4 a kilowatt hour on demand. 2 to $4 a kilowatt hour revenue on demand versus 12 cents, right? So if you're going to operate ASICs or GPUs, you're thinking, what is the most profitable convert? And by the way, we're publicly traded, right? So I want to deliver value for shareholders, right? Um, yeah, I'm a Bitcoiner and I love the ethos of, you know, the world's decentralized energy backed currency and I'm happy to have a whole conversation about that. But when you look at delivering value for shareholders, how can we consume a jewel of energy, right? And every single one of us, when we're shopping for ASICs, we're looking at joules per terahash. You consume joules, your output is hash. That's your golden ratio, right? And so when we bought mining for ETH, it's the same thing. But the common denominator is, of course, dollars per kilowatt hour. So that's the lens that we view it through. And so then you look at the value of your rack space. Now, obviously, tier three has got uptime, UPS is cooling, et cetera. It's kind of apples and oranges compared to crypto mine. The bones are similar. You've got power, high, power, high density power distribution. And so now what we're seeing in the data center space is, you know, megawatts are valued at two to $3 million a megawatt in the data center world. We have that access to power. And so we have uh, sites that we own and operate that we have the ability to convert on a near-term basis to HPC, but we've been generating revenue. What we call HPC is, is our, our parlay into AI revenue, right? It's kind of a nagalist term. Um, we've been doing for a year and a half, right? We started reporting revenue calendar Q1 last year, right? And we just closed out this last quarter doing about 7 million annualized run rate revenue. So our approach has been to repurpose the GPUs, NVIDIA GPUs that were mining Ethereum into doing HPC. And so we've been walking we grew our revenue from a million ARR to seven plus, and we're about to sprint, right? And so that's kind of the approach that we take. We're, we're an innovation company. So we start with R&D, we figure it out, we start walking, we start generating money, and then we make the big splash. Just, do you have anything you want to add to that, gonna, Tom? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, I have to give credit to Frank Holmes because uh, I remember going to a, a conference in early 2022, and Frank was on stage at a Bitcoin mining conference, and he was uh, opining on this strategy with the Ethereum mining, and he made a very important distinction that I think fits into the framework of this like mullet mindset, which was, he was like, hey, we're, u we're utilizing these high margins in the, in the ETH mining to basically guarantee that we never have to sell our Bitcoin. And, you know, I think that same type of strategy is like how miners should be thinking about things because at the end of the day, that's the thing that's most valuable. That's the precious, as like Smeagol would say. I want to keep that Bitcoin. <laughs> that's really good. I like that. I had just one, uh, one more question to you on the HPC and AI front. Um, what were some of the challenges in standing up this... Um, standing up this new business line. You know, you had the GPUs already, but um, were there any obstacles when you were trying to repurpose those for HPC? Um? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's way more complicated than crypto mining. So, I think um, 
you know, the panel did a good job of really exemplifying that when you're mining crypto, you plug in servers and you start hashing and you earn block rewards and transaction fees, right? You don't need a sales team. You don't have demand. You don't have clients, right? With HPC, first of all, the cluster of GPUs that you're building is at a tier three level, right? We are Ethereum mining rigs. To give you some specificity, this is the mining stage. You know, I'm sure there's technical guys in the audience. We upgraded the rigs that we used to mine uh, Ethereum with, which is really a server, right? To a data center grade enterprise level server, we partner with Supermicro. And so these servers had, you know, dual Intel Gold Series CPUs, seven terabytes of onboard storage, 500 gigabytes of RAM. And so really you're building a cluster of supercomputers. They're all in one rack and then they all have to be stitched together with high speed ethernet, right? So it's building that next generation, high power density, uh, next generation compute. And it's very different than crypto mining, right? We've also got sub H100s that we're running as well. And the power density, like the next generation of what NVIDIA, like I was at GTC in March uh, in Silicon Valley. Uh, you know, we got a chance to meet Jensen. It was awesome. And their latest and greatest product, the NVL72 is 120 kilowatts per rack, right? And just to put that into context, like that's one data center rack, right? Um, back in the days, like the telecom racks were 10 to 15 kilowatts. Today, 40 kilowatts is considered high power and the air cooled goes up to 80 kilowatts a rack and the liquid cooled next generation stuff that's shipping next year is 120 kilowatts per rack. So to summarize, you've got enterprise grade servers, like little supercomputers. You've got to stitch it together with super high speed network. And then you've got to have high density liquid cooled infrastructure to put it all together. And then you've got to figure out, well, where are you going to sell your compute to and that whole thing, right? So, so that last bit, and uh, Rob, Mitch, we'll get back to you all in a second. Sorry, this is just, you got some good stuff cooking right here. Um, I think uh, to hit on a point that Rob was making earlier, you know, when you think about Bitcoin mining, the customer, um, you know, is if you're a miner, is either a mining pool um, and you're also a customer of the mining pool or you're selling your hash rate directly to the Bitcoin network, hoping that you'll win a block, Right. Um, with HPC and AI, I've always wondered what these marketplaces are actually like. Because when you think about liquidating hash rate for Bitcoin, there are, you know, there are a bunch of different pools you can choose. You can go directly to the network, but more or less, your expected payout is going to kind of all be the same across those because the market usually um, you know, kind of meets into the middle on a certain rate. Obviously, your revenue for mining can fluctuate wildly if you're self-mining. But if you're going to a pool, most of them pay out the same, uh, you know, similar methodology, right. the same amount of money, right? So with regards to HPC and AI uh, markets, um, what do those marketplaces even look like? like? I'll tell you exactly what they look like. So the UX is the marketplace, right? So users and users that want to go on and rent some GPUs. We've got tier three in Stockholm, Sweden, and Montreal, which by the way is a separate facility than our Bitcoin mine, right? Completely different, right? Bitcoin mine's rugged. It's like an F-150, Tier three is like a Ferrari, it's refined, it's cooled, you know. And so the user goes onto the marketplace, they could click the GPU that they want based on the amount of VRAM it has, you know, the flop speed, whatever, and they can rent it for hours, days, or weeks. It's literally a click menu. You're in North America, if you're in New York, oh, I want to go to Montreal, it's closer to me. I want to rent an A40, I want to rent an H100, and you know, an H100 is four bucks an hour, an A40 is 80 cents an hour, whatever, and you click it, rent it, run. We just provide the back end, so they'll SSH from that portal to physically to our servers and get root access, and then they run their job, right? And so that's how we have no sales force. We do a B2B model. I mean, you know, we obviously have a DevOps and SysOps teams that interacts with these marketplaces, and we try to run that as 24-7 as we can, because we're already in nine time zones as a country. We have operations in Sweden, Iceland, and Canada, so that gives us an edge. And, um, and that's it. So it's infrastructure as a service at the GPU level, selling compute. The marketplaces deal with the end customers. So we have to deal with AML or KYC or any of that stuff and not have like a massive sales team. How, how about like revenue? Like does it fluctuate like Bitcoin mining does in that sense? Yeah, yeah, it, it does. It does because people are running jobs, they're running inferences, they're running trainings, they're running fine tunes. Uh, you know, we had a, we had a stellar uh, week uh, a couple months ago where someone was training a model and like 
all of our GPUs were rented. It was this, this huge demand, right? So there is a little bit, a bit of that fluctuation, but we also see the importance of doing long-term large contracts with end users. But I think presumptive crypto miners who want to get into the AI space are going to A, need to learn to figure out to build the infrastructure, B, figure out how to have the uptime because what if you have a DDoS attack? What if there's, you know, uh, you know a server... Um, you know, crashes or whatever. Like, there's a lot of stuff. So before you start taking on long-term six-month contracts, you can't afford to have it go down in that six months, right? And so you have to have, like, super dialed-in ops to get to that level, right? So um, that gives you more stability, but the trade-off is then you're renting at a discounted price, right? So there's a, there's a whole um, economic layer to the GPU pricing strategy. And again, we've been at it for a year plus, so we've developed that acumen and business intelligence. Cool. You look, yeah, you look like you're ready yeah, to hop we, in there, Rob. Could, just by show of hands, have, have any of you actually, I know many of you have, how many of you have been in a mega mine? And so I, I know 30% of you already, 40% of you. Um, just to give some he context what Aiden is saying, when, when he's talking about networking, when he's talking about structuring these facilities, just for context, right? Essentially, a Bitcoin miner is is a machine that you plug into a wall and then you abuse the hell out of it until it dies. Um, a GPU is something that you need to build a custom garage for because it is your Ferrari, it is your GTO, it is your baby. And the, the infrastructure differences that you have physically in these setups could not be more night and day. When you look, when you look at some of these containerized solutions that we have assembled here, these are shipping containers you can buy one for $3,500 from a shipping container broker. You can find a buddy who knows how to laser cut. You can throw some filters that you would still have in, in, in your household. You can throw some large industrial fans in it. And you can run Bitcoin miners. You, you cannot do that for GPUs. You can get a Starlink and you can put it in the middle of West Texas. And you can just let those S19s scream. Well, put, put what's miners in it, first of all. Um, you can let those what's miners whine to you that their, their power supplies are hot, but they will, not, they will not die. They will continue to run. Um, you can run it off a of Starlink, and it will be largely fine as long as you don't get a mega dust storm or you don't get some you know, torrential downpour. What, what you're describing is really, it, you're describing fundamentally just the conversion into uh, top tier data centers. You're describing this transition from folks who have acquired massive amounts of load, and really that's, that's our lifeblood, is, is we're consuming load, we're consuming electricity, and you're taking something and you're sort of converting the old garage into a place that instead, a of, laboratory. Working, instead of doing work on your, your 2001 air-cooled dirt bike, you're now polishing the floors a little bit, and we're trying to figure out how to park a Ferrari in it. Um, and that's interesting. It's interesting as a strategy, but it's What's interesting is, uh, to me as well is that it's become the zeitgeist. It's really become so popular and people have jumped on it. And so I'm curious to think, well, a, a, an M60 doesn't need a top tier data center. I don't, I don't need that kind of connectivity. Like, dude, like put me in the backyard with a Starlink. Um, are, they all, are they all going to the secondary market? Are we just going to, uh, we're going to sell them and, and we're going to run GPUs for the rest of the, the, the universe at Hive? It's, it's interesting to me how that strategy develops. And what I'm curious to see in the future is as these, as these publicly traded miners assess their fiduciary duty and what their vision and mission is as an organization, there is an entirely legitimate reason to stay very focused on capitalizing your power and doing it in the most efficient way possible, which means retrofitting your facility. And there's a very legitimate reason that you would have to continue to let those machines just scream in the desert until the end of time and stick to Bitcoin. Um, so it's interesting to me to hear your perspective about how you're capitalizing on the megawatt and transitioning from these ASICs to these GPUs and changing your, your data center. Um, and I'm very curious to see what the, the broader public markets do in terms of how they change and how investors respond to this. Yeah, I think it was a lot more of organic evolution for us because we had thousands, tens of thousands of GPUs already. So, you know, we weren't going, you know, 100 miles an hour this way and cranked it in reverse. And it, like, we were already running one of, like, I, I've been to a lot of crypto mines and I believe our site in northern Sweden, which Johanna right there oversees, um, you know, we had 120,000 GPUs running in the ETH mining days, right? A third of those were NVIDIA data center grade GPUs, which we pivoted to doing um, HPC. So, 
we were already on that track. We already had that IQ. We already had that discipline of running large fleets of GPUs. So it was rather conducive to us. And because we have this highest cash flow return on invested capital model, ETH was a high margin business. The margins are so much higher in HPC and is within arm's reach for us. And so we kind of set that up. I mean, we made that purchase in 2021 of the GPUs, right? Uh, you know, a year and a half ahead of the merge. So we're always trying to think two steps ahead of what's next. And so you kind of anticipate, you innovate, and that's how, you know, a little bit of tailwinds at your back, you land in a fortuitous position, right? But I agree. I mean, if you're running, you know, M60s in the deserts and containers, I would say it's not necessarily plausible to convert that into a tier three. I mean, th there, there's infrastructure that's really good for Bitcoin mining. You've got interruptible power load. And, you know, the, the consumption and nature of mining crypto is good for those adaptive raw power loads, right? Like, I mean, you know, flared gas mining, right? That's also a great opportunity to mine Bitcoin, but you wouldn't use that for tier three, right? So I think it's almost like a get in where you fit in situation is a simple way to put it. Yeah. Yeah, and just to add, like, maybe a little bit of a provocative thought is, you know, a, a lot of, like, where these decisions are coming from is where you think things are going. And there's a lot of assumptions in Bitcoin mining that usually um, they're sacred cows, and they end up being wrong. You know, like, there was uh, the last happening in 2020, um, everyone thought, like, S9s were dead, they're never coming back, you know, and then literally five months Long later. Long live the S9. You know, it was, it was what's that? Long live the S9. Exactly, exactly. And so there was a lot of us who just went with the conventional, you know, wisdom on that. And there was a, a quote by Adam Back, I want to say, you, you know, like 2016, 2017, where he said, whoever builds the best chicken shack miner wins. And to all my friends from that class of 2018, he was kind of getting into mining. Like back then it was very cool to develop like the best, the best Bitcoin mining containers and it remove all the... Um, all the dust and everything like that. And like when it really comes down to it, it's like all those really fancy boxes really got blown out for cheap, effective, cost-effective, fast boxes. And because there was so many ASICs, people wanted to get them online and that kind of drove things. And people, I mean, I've, seen, I've, been, in, I've been into farms where there's literally no filters and they make it work. And it's because they, they, you know, they've, they've gotten certain um, incentives to do that. And so if that's the case with, with ASICs, when no, and everyone said you cannot do it, it will, it'll be very bad. Now, there were some, some things that happened in West Texas where things went very bad for some, for some miners. I think there's a, a scenario where a new segment gets created within HP, HPC AI, meaning the tier three stuff that we hear about is like, you know, it just gets drummed into your head. You've got to have that. I think with the demand that there is out there for GPUs, the market will come for sub tier three data or for compute centers. And therefore, there will be some new opportunities moving forward because there will, there will be a change from uh, data modeling to more inference, maybe back and forth. And with those two different ways of doing compute, there are different trade-offs that you might not need that you would need in a tier three. So um, I think there's, there's going to be a little bit of a wild west that kind of takes place right now with that. Appreciate all the input, y'all. Mitch, I want to pass you the puck, man. You've been, you've been so patient over there. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll say one thing that really comes to mind for me in this conversation is you guys are GPU mining Ethereum, and I think it's a good, a good time to highlight the difference between Ethereum and Bitcoin, right? Ethereum switched from proof of work to proof of stake, and obviously you're strategic with your pivot to AI and, and sort of taking advantage of that, but this change in protocol, like if you had all these GPU miners, like you were forced to pivot, right? With Bitcoin, there's nobody in charge. Nobody can change the protocol. It's far different than, than Ethereum or any of these other cryptos. And it, I think that's just a really important point to highlight. Like nobody's going to change Bitcoin's consensus mechanism. Like the miners aren't going to be rug pulled and have to entirely change their operational strategy like with some of these other altcoins. Yeah, I mean, that's why we didn't get into staking. Like we're proof of workers through and through. And our AMD GPUs paid themselves over 3 to 4x. And at Tom's point, which is a really good one that you highlighted, it allows to leapfrog in the Bitcoin business because we're selling our ETH for high margin. That allowed us to hodl, right? So it was a phenomenal business. And 
we use the proceeds from our ETH mining business to build our Intel block scale miners, which we call the buzz miners, right? So again, we're publicly traded. So at the end of the day, shareholder value, high margin, high cash flow, earnings per share. We, we're, we have a fiduciary obligation to think through that lens. Um, but at the same time, like I said, we're Bitcoiners. That's why I have 2,500 plus Bitcoin on the balance sheet. And I agree. Yeah, like I think the, I'll say it on record. I think ETH going to proof of stake was a huge mistake, right? Like, come on, right? Like proof of work is, I mean, it's been running for 15 years on Bitcoin, right? So here's another 15 years or 120 or 1,000. Mitch, I want to ask you uh, one question really quickly. We've got about 10 minutes. Um, kind of refocusing back on Bitcoin mining away from AI. One of the business lines that a lot of uh, industrial scale Bitcoin miners have often uh, or historically have pursued has been hosting, obviously, right? Makes sense. You get, you know, enough space, enough infrastructure built for like 50 megawatts, fill 25 megawatts with your own machines, you know, uh, lease out the rest of the 25 megawatts to various uh, clients and things like that. Now that uh, the fourth halving is passed and we're at you know, basically all-time low hash price. We're not quite at all-time low, but we're only about five bucks off on a pet hash per day basis. Um, what are your thoughts on how the hosting landscape is going to have to change or shift in the coming years to accommodate this new normal? Because obviously, Bitcoin mining, um, you know, hash price trades and backwardation, it's always trending towards zero. What are hosting providers going to have to do to remain competitive? And what are hosting clients going to have to do to make sure that they can stay online in this new environment? Yeah. Well, number one thing to remain competitive is to get high quality operations with low cost power. Like objectively, Bitcoin mining is it's a race to the lowest cost of energy, right? And and hosted mining, there's been, you know, some bad operators in the past and there's been some problems, right? It's uh had a lack of transparency. There's been really long lead times, right? A lot of the the gains in Bitcoin happen in a very few amount of trading days every year, right? And so you want to be online to capitalize on those bull markets and you know, time is money. If you're looking to host your machines with someone and there's months between when you make the purchase and when your machine actually gets plugged in, you're going to miss a lot of that upside. And so having turnkey hosting, that's something we've offered at Blockware. We built a marketplace so you can buy hosted machines that are online today, hashing right now, paying Bitcoin as soon as your transaction's confirmed on chain. So the lead time's eliminated. Another, another problem has historically been transparency, right? You don't know, you know, where's your machine been? How long has this been online? Is it actually hashing? You know, what's this serial number? All this stuff. So the Blocker Marketplace makes it super transparent. You can see the serial number of your machine, know if it's under warranty, and you can actually see its, its historical hash rate performance. You can see exactly where it's plugged in. So yeah, I think uh, the number one thing with, with hosted mining is to get, get the lowest cost power you can and to, you know, have a, a high quality partner that you go into business with hosting is the worst <laughs> it's it's just the worst it's so tell bad us, tell us why personal experience yes there's only one reason why <laughs> there's only one reason why as somebody who may or may not have um, found an operation that had a mix of self mining and hosting in Wyoming um, hosting is the worst here's why you go into hosting because you have the money to set up a facility, but you don't have the money to buy machines. It's essentially, I have the skills to build the nicest garage ever to keep all of the McLarens and the Ferraris in, but I don't have any money to buy McLarens and Ferraris. And then people are going to come to you, and they're going to ask to park their McLarens and Ferraris in this garage that you have put a lot of work into. And then they're going to drive them, and you're going to make... $25 a month, washing their McLaren, changing the oil on their McLaren, making sure the McLaren is accessible 24 hours a day, seven days a week, keeping the live feed that you have very nicely set up in the corner to watch the McLaren so they can show their friends when they're doing poker night. And the second that feed goes down, they are going to call you and let you know that you have destroyed all of their business models because they cannot see their McLaren. It's the worst thing ever. The only reason you do it is because, as somebody who's setting up a facility, because you have the skills or the capital to set up that facility, but you can't capitalize the machines, because ma machines, by and large, are the largest capital outlay when you're setting up these facilities. The way that you monetize it, the kind of margin that you can extract, if you, if you find a, a price of electricity that you're able to get, say, sub-five cents consistently, 
the first thing you should be thinking in your mind is not, how do I run out and find somebody to go and stock my shelves? The first thing you should be doing is finding all of the bankers and lenders on the face of the earth and acquiring all the ASICs that you can to operate in that facility. Because as that margin disappears, that's the only money that you have to make. And the only way to set these contracts up in a way where neither party feels like they're getting absolutely taken for a ride is to sometimes do a cost where you pay the cost of electricity and then we'll manage your pool. There's all these counterparty risk issues around who is watching what, where is the money going. You can do profit shares. You can do fixed price margins. There's risks. If you do a fixed price margin, so I'm going to make it for, I get my cost of electricity at four and a half cents, five cents, and I'm going to charge you seven cents, six and a half, based on your volume, whatever it might be. During the bear market, I'm going to feel amazing because my risk has been hedged as an operator. During the bull market, I'm going to feel like an idiot because that margin that you have is just expanding, expanding, expanding as the hash price is running away. So I say maybe we do a profit share. Well, when that profit share comes in and the bear market comes through, I'm making 20 cents on a dollar or I'm making 20 cents of nothing, rather, if there's no margin to be had. So I'm basically doing a bunch of maintenance and upkeep work for free. Now, during the bull market, I might feel great about myself, but I'm totally exposed to this bear and bull cycle as an operator. And if you're, you're putting in the work, I can tell you it is, a, it is a very thankless place to be. And you were the first one on speed dial if things go south. So I would say, as a customer, if you want to be a customer of hosting, know your numbers, be very conscientious of what you're doing, work with somebody reputable. I've heard in, in the um, agricultural side of Bitcoin, they say, shake your rancher's hand shake your host's hand, go and know these people, hedge your counterparty risk. Um, I would be very wary as an individual getting into hosting. And from personal experience and personal pain, I'm very wary of, uh, uh, of setting up hosting as a service or, or pursuing hosting as a service. Yeah, you, know, you, make, you make some really valid points, but I will say, you know, the title of this panel is Diverse Strategies, right? And if I put myself in the shoes of a site operator, I want hosting as a means of diversifying, right? Because Bitcoin has these massive bull markets and obviously you want to be driving the Ferrari, as you say, during that. You want to be self-mining and capturing those profits. But objectively, hash price, it, it's going down most of the time, right? You know, Bitcoin's near its all-time highs, but hash price is near its all-time lows. If you're a site operator and you're capturing a spread on the energy as a host right now, that's protecting you in these scenarios when hash price goes down. So I think it's it's mostly wise to do both. All right, I respectfully disagree. I appreciate those uh, inputs and that back and forth. We only have about two minutes, 30 seconds. Um, lightning round really quick, 30 seconds each. Most important things for miners to consider over the next four years. Uh, Tom, let's start with you and then go Iden and then go Rob and then go Mitch. Sure thing. Uh, first thing I think of is jurisdiction. Uh, so, you know, basically... The most important decision you can make, especially if you're setting up infrastructure, not if you're an asset light miner, because you can, you know, you can move your miners wherever. But if you're setting up infrastructure, jurisdiction is the most important thing right now. And I would say that there are arguments to be made with all jurisdictions right now, just given kind of the volatility that there is globally. And um, you know, I would say I'm long uh, U.S. red states because they would probably have the best form of. Uh, you know, property rights. And more importantly, I think they're willing, like if you see what's happening, uh, like in upstate New York, where they're getting like very predatory with their legislation, where do those, where do those miners go? They're coming to states like Tennessee and Texas and in other red states. And, um, you know, I, I think that that trend will continue. And most, yeah, that's, that's what you need to do is you have to have, um, you have to have some conviction around where you're setting up your moat. Because it's not just about setting up, it's then also being able to build there. Because a lot of these um, grid operators are coming around to the idea that like, wait a minute, these Bitcoin miners are actually an advantage to us. Like they can turn on and turn off and help us when we're trying to come up with new power generation. So if we can be there for a long time, we're gonna be a very good partner for them. I will second that. Um, Jurisdiction is, is the most important play thing, right? Because you do not, you can't really pick up your site and move it somewhere else. And the United States is going to be the number one place for Bitcoin mining. It already is. It's going to continue to be that way. And specifically red states, I agree. And at Block, where we, uh, we operate facilities in Kentucky, Texas, Oklahoma, and Iowa. So I think that tells you everything you need to know about where to mine Bitcoin. If, my, my final thought is, if you don't know your edge, if you don't know 
precisely what your edge is in the mining industry and you don't know how that models out in your business model, don't do it. Don't try to be a pure play Bitcoin miner. You have an edge or you don't. Is it heat? Is it load? Is it something fancy you're doing with your hash rate? Whatever it is, know your edge and don't execute on it unless you actually know it and have modeled it out. Aiden, anything? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, just adding on. Uh, obviously, stable jurisdiction is important. We've been running in our jurisdictions, Canada, Sweden, Iceland, pretty much since 2017. Um, but building on that, the true fundamentals, which is simple but not easy, really good uptime, low overhead, so you don't have, you're not top heavy, whether it's corporate GNA or cost of goods, right? Like direct operating costs. So you know exactly what your true operating costs are with your dollar per terahash purchase of every batch of ASICs with their efficiency in joules per terahash, the revenue that they're throwing off in dollars per megawatt hour, which will of course vary based on hash price on dollars per terahash, which all is underpinned mathematically, you have to religiously study that day in, day out, and make sure you ROI within that year, if you can. Maybe that got stretched out to 18 months, but in a bull market, you have to make money on your ASICs. They have to free cash flow. So these are net accretive investments. You have to have the mindset of, if you can't just tap the markets for capital, are you actually making money as a business? And so understanding hash rate economics, modeling them extensively, and on a variant basis, so you can weather, you know, we're, we're dialed into to weather sub $30 hash price, right? Like, that's why we upgraded our fleet. And, and that's really it. It's obviously, like I said, it's simple in principle. It's not easy in execution. And that's why you saw miners go bankrupt in 2022. And that was only $50 hash price, right? So we're at 45 now. So see what happens. Getting dicey out there. Well, I'd Getting choppy, baby. <laughs> yeah. Well, Gentlemen. <laughs> Frank's favorite thing. I love it. It's, which way is Bitcoin going, baby? <laughs> to the moon <laughs> well hey gentlemen thank you so much appreciate all the uh, insightful comments and the discussion and y'all enjoy the conference thanks for joining us Bringing the Bitcoin Conference to the American West, Las Vegas. The brightest minds in the world will converge to deliver Bitcoin history. Buy your tickets now at b.tc slash conference slash 2025.